Good afternoon, American Underground. Awesome opportunity to be with you this afternoon. You know, all that stuff, blah, 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 that all sounds good. I'm the one who's honored to have an opportunity to spend time around you. Uh, because I've been in the world of business. I'm 54 years old. I've been with Hilton for 30, blah, 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 some years. So anytime I have an opportunity to get out of the office and interface with customers, people, fellow entrepreneurs who make a difference, that's something that energizes me. And man, as I've had an opportunity to walk around this building and spend time with Adam and others and the leadership team, to meet some of you individually, you have something really, really special. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about culture. You already have kind of a culture that exists here among the community of American Underground. And it's something very, very special. So hopefully what we have an opportunity to do is build on that and think about culture maybe from a slightly different perspective because it does matter. It does make a difference. <laughs> so thank you for allowing me to be with you today, Adam and Tink. Um, before we kick off culture, kind of a gooey word, who wants to throw out, what does culture mean? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah. Uh, memories that you have. Memories, okay. Anybody else want to throw out something else? Yeah. Hey, consistent behavior. Consistent behavior. Norms. Norms, absolutely. All those things kind of fit to, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, trust. Trust, wow, those are all good words. And, and you know, those are all um, emotive words, and sometimes in the world of business, businesses trip up on words that are emotive because they're hard to quantify. So what we're going to do today is kind of to walk through a story of how I've learned to appreciate the value of culture, share with you some examples of how it's come to life in the businesses that I've had an opportunity with, and give you maybe an opportunity to think about how those can impact what you do every day as you're building these thriving businesses that are going to be wildly successful. Um, you know, each of us in the room, we're going to kind of start with a couple of headlines, and you already know this. Each of, the, each of us in the room today are a brand, right? Whether it's the product or service that you're working on launching or have launched and are now maturing, or it's your personal brand. You represent a brand, how you bring yourself to work every single day, your, your presentation style, your communication style, etc. And each of you in the room today, each of us in the room today are leaders. You may be a team of one. This is kind of a, it, it's a, a simple statement, but we need to remember that even if you're a team of one as an entrepreneur, you are a leader because you impact many, many people around you. And kind of as part of being that brand and that leader, each of us kind of naturally or kind of uh, accidentally create a culture that begins to articulate how people feel about interacting with us as leaders and then about our business. You know, as I think about one, I'm a fellow North Carolinian and I grew up in Asheville, North Carolina, Ooh. up in the mountains. Whoa, 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 whoa. And I, if, I, if I think about, you know, my roots, does anybody even know who that's a picture of? <laughs> Minnie Pearl, she was somebody who was around many, many years ago, and if they, she was an entertainer, and if there was everybody, who, anyone who ever kind of lived a brand and, a, and a, a leadership position as an entertainer culture, it was her. Her trademark thing was to come out with her, howdy, so glad to be here, so that's a nod to my fellow. She's laying back there, I'll try to keep my southern, uh, my southern colloquialisms down here. She wore a hat that was always goofy, had a name tag on it. She, she always kind of created an environment, a feeling around her that really resonated with people. And so whether it's Minnie Pearl or whether it's somebody like me, I mean, I'm, I'm very fortunate with Hilton today to lead a part of Hilton with these three brands, Hilton Garden Inn, Hampton and True. We're up to about $10 billion in revenue. We're the biggest brand in America. Every night we have about 411,000 people who sleep with us. We were talking last night, every day we go through 368,000 rolls of toilet paper. You know, so it's, it's an amazing journey to think about how culture kind of ties all those things together, whether it be iconic figures from the past or today, um, or as we think about our roles as leaders and what culture means. And I'm a firm believer in that. Some words came up earlier about when we said what is culture, it's trust, it's, it's social norm, it's actions. Um, if we looked at a whole bunch of Latin words there and fancy words, really at the core of culture, it's all about 
cultivating. Cultivating. And culture is one of those things that just doesn't happen. We're going to talk a little bit about maybe my perspective on how that journey occurs. But it's something that you just don't say, okay, we're going to create a, a, a book about how I as an individual in my company and a leader in my company is going to ensure that everybody experiences what's, what's going on. Um, it's something that has to be cultivated along the way. It has to be. It's not a one and done kind of thing at all. And, and you, you guys threw out some of these words, so I'm just kind of repeating a little bit. But culture is a self-sustaining pattern of behavior that determine how things are done. And so again, I would go back and kind of ask you to think about yourself as entrepreneurs in this organization or as students. And with a product or service that you're creating, your product or service is going to stand out or not stand out based on its merit. But again, there's part of a, a, a we emotional side that has to be part of that picture if you're successful on a go-forward basis. Why does culture matter? I mean, I'm going to quickly go through some slides here. There's all kinds of studies we've done with Harvard and Gallup and others that kind of reinforce why it matters. But really, we've been able to, to direct a direct link between culture, team member motivation and engagement, and profitability. And again, I need for you to help me think about each of you, as even if you're an entrepreneur today of one, how you keep yourself engaged and that team, informal team maybe that's around you, of partners, agencies, thought partners, how do you keep each other engaged so that you're moving your vision and your ideas ahead? Because it does tie down to, to engagement and it leads to profitability. If we were to talk to a bunch of uh, business leaders, they're all going to say culture is important. But look at that striking number there in the bottom right hand corner. Only 15% said corporate culture is exactly where it needs to be. And I think sometimes that's because, again, as I said earlier, people think it's a gooey, emotive thing. How, what do you do with it? It just kind of naturally happens on its own. Uh -uh. I'm a firm believer that it does not happen on its own. And it all starts with kind of each of our levels of personal engagement and how that engagement carries forward to those who work around us. You know, in, in my position, I work with uh, 4,300 franchisees or something that I don't have the ability to kind of directly influence every day. I have carrots and sticks that I can use to try to influence behavior. I work with 4,300 of them, and then I work with over 120,000 team members around the world who don't report to me. They report to other individuals and not to me and my brand. So how do I kind of try to get them engaged? Because if we look at Gallup, and Gallup is known for obviously polling and other things that we're all very familiar with, but they're also very engaged in the idea of leadership development, and they've helped us do some work to understand that not only from a customer perspective, but from a team member expect, uh, perspective, that if you are, they look at it on a five level scale. I'm either fully engaged with an organization, a leader, or I'm actively disengaged. So if you're fully engaged, if you have a team or a customer base of fully engaged people, that means those people are almost kind of evangelists for you. They're out spreading the word and helping do a lot of the work that you can't do yourself to, to tell people what a great company or great individual you are. And at the other end of the spectrum, those actively disengaged people, we actually kind of call terrorists because they're the ones who are out telling as many people as they can how much they hate you or how much they hate your company or how much they hate what you stand for. And while it doesn't take too many of those terrorists to kind of destroy everything that we can work so hard at to keep our team members, ourselves, all those around us engaged. So engagement does matter. And we know that it's, it's the, one of the number one drivers of satisfaction at work. You know, we actually did some profitability work. And we looked at hotels that had team members that were engaged. So we, we administered this Gallup tool. And Gallup came back through uh, research and told us that in analytics for hotels that had team members that were actively engaged, and really they, we, we measure active engagement with Gallup through eight very simple questions. I have a best friend at work. I have a leader who talks to me about my performance. Very, very simple things. For those hotels who had a higher than norm percentage of actively engaged team members, they drove premiums in market share and guest satisfaction of 25 points. 
over those hotels that were at the norm. So engagement makes a difference, and the way that we get people engaged is one of the key ways that we get people engaged is through culture. So what does a cultivated culture feel like? A um, couple of examples I want to share with you that kind of one that you may have an opportunity to resonate with. One of the things I enjoy the most as a leader, one of the things that scares me the most is our world is changing so quickly that I'm afraid that I don't know what I don't know. And sometimes as senior leaders in an organization, we become very insular, kind of looking at things through a lens of one or through a lens of our company. We miss what's happening in the world around us. And one of the things I enjoy the most is getting out several times a year and doing something called a train track, where I have an opportunity to spend with entrepreneurs like yourself who have actually gone to the launch phase and are activating businesses in the community and see how they work and to understand what are they thinking, why are they successful, what challenges are they facing, what trends do they see that are happening not only kind of in their landscape, but then how can I take those learnings and translate those into my business. And a gentleman named Nick Alt started a company uh, called Vinyl, based out in Los Angeles, El Segundo, California. I don't know how many people in here, I'm the old guy, but I don't know how many people remember the Columbia Record and Tape Club. It was a deal where you signed up for 99 cents or something, and then once a month they sent you eight tapes, cassette tapes, oh my god, or eight track tapes, or whatever it was, of music that kind of fit your musical profile, and you got billed for those eight every month. Well, they kind of fell aside as a result of all the ways that we're able to share music today. But Nick kind of realized that as we think about you ladies and gentlemen, and others with your mindset, there's something kind of nostalgic about vinyl records. You know, we can all listen to music in its purest form um, through whatever musical platform we use. But he started to feel like, you know, there's something unique about giving people an opportunity to <coughs> feel and hear, sometimes the slight imperfection, but the depth and the tone of music that's reflected on LP, on vinyl records, that's not part of today's listening experience for many people. So he created this company called Vinyl, and what they do is actually curate based on a profile that you build online. Um, a profile of the types of music that you're likely to enjoy and every month for a fee they send you four LP albums that tie to your profile and really so what Nick and his team have been able to do is grow from being a, a subscription base of about 70 to today a subscription base of 8,000 subscribers and that's in the course of about 18 months and he really does it in, in some really simple way knowing the industry and the classics, having the insight to have people who are experts in music, communicating in a fresh and sincere way and responding to customers' attitudes. So one of the very first things that happens when you join Vinyl is you get some kind of a communication, typically an email, from your musical curator who says, hey, I'm Josh, this is my photo. I want to talk to you a little bit more to make sure I understand what you look for in music so that I can help you make the, the best selections of what to send you every month. And then every month, Josh sends, with you, sends to you with your four records a handwritten note that says, here's why I selected the four um, albums that I did for you. This one is by artist XYZ, and I think you'd like it because of your joy and, and pleasure with XYZ. So they've kind of taken this whole idea of nostalgia with personalization, something we talked a lot about with the group this morning, how personalization, localization, why that's so important and package that in a way that makes customers feel important, recognized, and understood. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, but that all comes kind of through culture. So vinyl is a really cool example of that. At the opposite end of the spectrum, I've had an opportunity to work a lot with Popeye's Fried Chicken. Cheryl Batchelder is the chairman there. Popeye's been around for 40 years, um, the second largest chicken QSR restaurant in the country. Her whole idea about culture is the idea of servant leadership. It's kind of an interesting concept, right? What can I do as your leader? Each of your leaders, what can I do as your leader to help you do your job better, to empower you, to help us be successful? So if you were to go to any Popeyes in the world, and, and, and you know, obviously when you're talking about businesses the scale that I work with, that many locations, 
$10 billion in business. Every location is not going to be perfect. I wish it could be. It's not going to be. You're going to run into the good and the bad. But what she's done is instill that level of servant leadership in her franchisees who carry that forward to their team members. Meet Miss Edith. Miss Edith is the manager of the Popeyes in the Atlanta airport in Concourse B that drives the highest level volume of any Popeyes in their 7,000 unit chain. And it's a storefront location. It's not a standalone location. It's a storefront walk-up location. It's the highest volume store that Popeyes has. And what Miss Edith does is she recognizes people who stay there regularly, who dine there regularly, creates a connection with them, and then encourages each of her team members to do the same. How many times have we been through an airport and it's no smile, maybe a thank you, it's a very cold transaction. But kind of in a southern way, you go see Miss Edith at the Atlanta airport, hey honey, glad you're here, you want your usual, so glad to see you, let me come give you a hug. So culture can take a lot of different roles in, in, in how it manifests itself, in fact, we're going to talk about that in a second. But it does make a difference. Nick, vinyl record, 700 subscribers to 7,000 subscribers in 18 months. Based on personalization, caring, and small touches that make a big difference. Popeye's fried chicken, servant leadership, instilling that in her managers, in her franchisees. What can we do to help them feel responsible? So big or small, culture absolutely matters. So I'm going to kind of share with you if the, you know, every speaker feels like they've got to have the three things that we're going to talk about that are going to be the nuggets for you, right? I think these are the three things. We're going to spend some time talking about them, and hopefully we'll find a way to help them resonate with you. Because I can't stress with you enough that culture has to happen within the organizations. It has to be an organic part of what you're doing that's going to help you be successful. You can have the most wildly differentiated product or service. It may not be successful. So we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about culture can't be scripted. Second is culture's got to flow through the entire organization's chain of influence. And then we're going to talk about why culture has to be a movement. And then we'll circle back after each of the, the three of these, talk a little bit about some uh, how they all come together and spend a bit more time together and kind of open up for questions. All right? So let's think about this first thing. Culture can't be scripted. There are a lot of organizations who think that they can put out a rule book or a guidebook about surface slash culture. This is the way we're going to answer the phone. This is how you interact with the customer. This is the way you need to feel, even if you don't feel that way on a certain day, right? All that doesn't work. That's, that's kind of fake. It's not genuine. It's, it's, whether it's your generation or those that follow, that's the antithesis. That's, that's the opposite of what people are looking for, is something that feels scripted. You know, one of the things that makes me crazy, it's a silly small example, but there's an Aloft hotel across the street that's now on the large competitors. And part of their deal is, when you walk up to the front desk of any Aloft in the world, they greet you by saying aloha, because they think that sounds kind of cool. Well, really? If you're in Durham, North Carolina, do you resonate with aloha when you walk to the front desk? So it's kind of a silly example, but again, when you try to script service, when you try to script culture, people don't react well to that because they don't, that doesn't allow them to bring their best self to work every single day. You know, back when we were talking about engagement, one of the key principles of engagement is making sure that we all recognize that we as individuals and those who work around us within our teams have key strengths, things we do very well, and a whole bunch of stuff that we don't do very well. And we've learned through time and science and data that we can share with you that if you focus on trying to, to do better the things that you don't do well, the, the return that you're going to get on that is minimal compared to the return you're going to get based on leveraging what you do well personally and doing even more of that. And that's really kind of what I think unscripted culture is all about. You know, with Hampton, the way we kind of 
think about that and with each of our focus service brands is you can't just say, okay, go out and kind of figure out what the brand is about. You've got to give some kind of guidepost to, to give people a framework from which to operate. With Hampton, it's these four little cartoon characters, friendly, authentic, caring, and thoughtful. But what we do is kind of provide that framework that then allows a franchisee, a general manager, a team member to say, okay, based on what I do best, how do I make that come to life every day through culture at my hotel? Right? If I naturally am just not a friendly person, I'm an introvert, then please don't force me to try to smile and be nice. But if I'm really good at thoughtful touches, knowing it's raining outside and making sure you get an umbrella to get to your car or whatever, I can do that really well, let me do that. So to me, it's not, it's not a rule book. It's not forced. It's got to be kind of organic in its growth. It can't be scripted. So one of the things we do with Hampton is kind of develop, a, we develop something called a learning map. So anytime we have a group of three or four new hires in a hotel at one time, we engage them in self-facilitated conversation around a very low-tech piece of paper that's called a learning map. And it kind of gives them a snapshot of different areas in the hotel where they have an opportunity to create service interactions, which is what culture is, a movement, how we act, how we behave as a business. Benchmark that versus the competition. And in a very engaging way, it creates scenarios where the team members draw cards and say, OK, I'm a guest who's just walked in, and this is what happened to me today. Then another member draws a card that says, OK, these are three different approaches I could uh, take to react to how that customer is walking in every day. And let's talk about how we create this right kind of culture in ways that bring out the best in each of us through these guideposts of friendly, authentic, caring, and thoughtful. So we get our team members engaged in the process, again, using some guidelines, not a rule book of understanding how that manifests itself. And that's really, really important. So first, it can't be scripted. You need guideposts to think about your individual businesses. Culturally, what does it stand for? Right? It doesn't have to be an acronym. It can be a simple word. It can be a statement. But kind of what do you want your customers, your team members, your, your, anybody within your, your circle of influence, what do you want them to feel when they think about the culture of your product or service and what it stands for? All right, so can't be scripted. Kind of second key thought is it all revolves around a chain of influence. I'll walk you through with how we think about that or how I think about that chain of influence as it relates to the business I'm in. Kind of starts with the brand, me, our leadership, our brand team that supports hotels every single day. We have to walk the talk. We have to be friendly, authentic, caring, and thoughtful in how we present ourselves as a team and how we interact with those around us. So then I've got brand teams, but then I've got this whole organization with 29 offices around the world that other, there are other corporate team members. So then how do I make sure my message, our message about culture resonates with those who support us? Then it's gotta make its way to our franchisees, those people who own our businesses that I don't directly manage, but without them, I have a disconnect in delivering the right kind of experience, the right kind of culture to customers. Then it's got to pass to general managers who live it, breathe it every single day. That makes its way then to hotel team members and ultimately to guests. And so once I've established kind of that, my, my FACT, whatever yours may be, of whatever my culture is, how do I make that amazingly strong through every link in that chain, because if there's one weak link in that chain, then it all falls apart. So this may not be your chain of influence, but I would challenge you to think about what is your chain of influence. It's you, for sure. Is it those who you may rely on for input and expertise from here within American Underground? Is it those outside that you go to for advice? Is it a third party agency or, or consultant or somebody that you may bring in? Is it the people who are, if you have a product or service developed, helping you bring that to life? I would just kind of challenge you to think about what is your chain of influence? And how do you make sure that you're connecting the dots in a way that everyone in that chain of influence 
is able to understand and resonate with what you, your company, and your culture stands for. Remember I shared earlier we have 34, no, 4,300 owners. This is Mitch Patel, he, um, amazing guy, started with one hotel. He has 65 hotels with us now. And he's just kind of reinforcing here in his statement what I shared with you earlier. It's hard to create a culture when a company owns all of its hotels. But when you have hundreds of franchisees and thousands of units, how do you pull that off? It's through the chain of influence. How do you make sure that everybody is walking the talk? You know, I, I get, I'm not going to sing to you because there's a, there's so many songs that I can sing. And you probably not too old. You would have heard about my newer versions. Maybe I would put your. But language is a very important part of culture and 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 one voice and how that communicates. So again, who's who's involved in your chain of influence and how do you keep them going? You know, in our case, one of our chains, one of those big important chains we talked about there. We got so we have franchisees that we just started up with Mitch there. We have general managers, so how do we allow them to kind of buy into what's going on? So just an example of one thing we do uh, is something called ShareCast. In corporate world, typically this would be a no-no because it's basically a social media site where general managers have the ability to go on, onto the site, kind of present challenges, opportunities, questions that they're facing, and through an internal community, kind of look for feedback and thoughts from others about how they can do a better job. Uh, we don't police that. And for some corporations, that would be kind of scary. It's like, oh my gosh, what if they say something about corporate, or what if they say something about a strategy you decided to do that's your own? It's going to, it's going to, you know, it's going to make you not look good. No, 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 no. It, 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 if you can allow those in your chain of influence to talk, talk openly about how they can bring your culture to life from their perspective, in whatever that platform is, conversations or or more structured uh, approaches, you have a win. You know, another part of that circle of influence is ultimately guests and team members. Um, TJ here is an amazing guy. He's a guest, but, but uh, TJ has a learning disability, but he is fascinated with elevators. Getting in elevators and just pushing buttons to go up and down and up and down and up and down. And he loves Hampton because TJ now has become kind of a rock star within many of our hotels. So, when TJ shows up, they take the time to make sure, okay, TJ, we've closed off this elevator just for you, just so we don't inconvenience our other guests. You're gonna have a good time, et cetera. Now, TJ has a loyal fan. He, he's created a Facebook page. He's doing all kinds of things. So that the hotels on their own kind of decided, well, this is how we're gonna, if TJ shows up at our hotel, this is what we're gonna do to make sure he becomes an advocate for who we are and what we are. So again, then you have a, the team members who are working to kind of create an experience for him that TJ will remember. And then you got TJ going out in his own way being kind of an advocate for your brand. So I mean, it's, it's really kind of the, the chain of influence, that, that circle of life is amazingly important. So second big idea is understanding and recognizing your chain of influence and making sure that everybody involved in that chain of influence, whoever that is in your organization, shares those common vision and values that align with the culture that you want ultimately your team members and your guests to experience, or your customers. Kind of third thing I think is culture has to be a movement. You know, we talked earlier about the Latin words, culture meaning to cultivate and how you just don't plan it and hope it all works out. It, it has to grow. How it's going to grow for you is very different from how it grows for us. In our case, one of the things that we do is we take general managers who are some of our strongest, most articulate, outspoken, high potential managers, and we place them in a program called Ambassador University. So we professionally offer them some development opportunities to grow as leaders, but then kind of selfishly we use them as advocates for going out and being mentors to other hotel general managers who need help and support or who need just a listening ear. We actually use them to help deliver training in some of our hotels. So again, we're, we're trying to make everyone in that circle of influence feel like they play a role in making it happen. Not just in understanding what the message is, but they're part of the movement of making it happen. So Ambassador U is one way we do that. Hamptonality we're going to come back to in a minute because that's a, a big one that was kind of a big insight for me. So 
in simple terms to me, if you kind of take those three ideas of culture can't be scripted, you've got to have some guideposts in place about who you are, what you stand for, and it's got to be clear enough that everybody can articulate that. So can't be scripted. You've got to think about all the people who touch that and you make sure they're coming together with you as, your, as a leader in a common voice, and then you kind of make that organic, you make them want to get engaged, because again, if they're engaged, engagement leads to profitability, or to customer satisfaction, all that stuff, then you kind of end up with what I call inside-out culture. Because what's really cool is when you kind of cultivate a culture internally, but then it becomes so organic that customers and others start to pick up on it, and kind of, it becomes just a way of how your business operates. It's not something that sits over here to the side. It's something that's integrated into everything that you do to keep your business moving ahead. So kind of three guideposts, three myths I want us to take a minute to try to dispel or to talk about. Um, the first is culture is only internal. And not true. Culture requires command and control, for sure not true. And culture won't translate geography and demographics. And again, I know each of us in this room are in a different place in our journey with our businesses of, of how this message may resonate with us. But I think again, if, if we can kind of dispel these myths and go back to those kind of three principles, we're in good shape. First, culture is only internal, not true. One of the things that's very important to me, and I'm sure that I, I'm an old-fashioned guy, right? So we have lots of opportunities in my business to connect with customers today. We send out surveys, we have social media sites, they would go out and sweep for feedback. We have lots of ways to kind of understand what customers are saying about us. Well, one of the things that I find most valuable is actually going out several times a year, sitting around a table with some of our most loyal customers, as well as those who used to be loyal to us and that disappeared off the radar screen to have a conversation with them about what do we do well, what do we not do well, how could we better meet your needs. And you'd be surprised at some of the things those simple face-to-face -face conversations can surface. So, you know, a challenge is to think about as we talk to our customers, potential or existing, depending on where we are in our journey of entrepreneurship, Yes, electronic communication, there's a lot of ways for us to kind of get feedback, but is there something there about the human touch that really makes a difference? I mean, silly tactical example, we were sitting around with a group of these guests and they said, we hate the, the shampoo and lotion and stuff that you have in the room because it's impossible to get the lid off. The way the bottle is built, it's so rigid that like, you can't get the top off, and then once you get the top off, the bottle is so rigid you can't get the damn stuff out of the bottle. Well, I don't know if that would have ever surfaced through some kind of a survey or not, but that's an insight that kind of, we said, okay, well, we can do something about that. And then as we started to kind of talk with customers about what Hampton is, because you know, the, the hotel industry, is somewhat of a commodity. We're all selling a box that has a bed and a bathroom and a, and a, a product, but really product can be copied, right? And product is a little bit different based on price point, right? What you get for 100 bucks at a Hampton is very different than the product you get for $500 at a, at a Conrad. But still, it's kind of variations on a theme. So, so the product itself has some kind of hard attributes, but the challenge is those hard attributes could be easily copied. <coughs> More important to me is the experience that goes around that. So when we talk to customers about Hampton and the Focus Service Brand, we talk a lot about that experience because we, we learn a lot of insights about what does it really mean, what does culture mean, what does good service really mean to you. And so I was sitting around having a conversation with a group of customers and actually one of the customers was talking about how he, um, he goes to this hotel and this always happens in the spirit of FACT or this team member does this, this team member does that. And he actually said, you know, the, I've come up with a name for, for, for how I call it. There's a customer. He said, I think you guys are all about Hamptonality. It's the personality that I experience when I stay at a Hampton. Hamptonality. So if you start to think about that, well, that's kind of an interesting, remember I said language matters, everybody's got to be involved in the chain of influence, everybody's got to be on the same page. 
Hamptonality is kind of a neat way for a customer who's been the recipient of service, culture, the bigger picture, to kind of articulate back what it's all about and gives us a common language and, and framework that's very easy to understand. So culture is not just the us part of the, the circle of influence. Customers, if they can get engaged with you, um, that's the deal, right? Why is Starbucks successful? Right? They engage with the customer. And so there's so many examples. Of if you can get the customer to buy into your culture, why it makes such a big difference. So it's, it's not just internal. So Hamptonality, we actually started to use in communicating to customers as a key cornerstone of what the brand is all about. We can talk about we have free Wi-Fi, and we have free breakfast, and we have free all this stuff, but really kind of giving them an opportunity to, for us to talk about what kind of service, what kind of culture we're all about. So again, it was a chance to take something and turn it inside out and actually talk to customers about it through marketing and advertising in a way that they resonate. And it actually came from the mouth of a customer. So it's not only internal, it's external. Culture requires command and control. We talked about this one earlier. It absolutely can't, that it, it's not. <coughs> F-A-C-T, friendly, authentic, caring, and thoughtful. This is one of our hotels who decided one of the ways they wanted to manifest itself is by making towel animals on the bed for every guest who checks in. Well, that's because the employee base they have at their hotel is, is um, from a country where the, the skill base has uh, worked in cruise ships and done some other things. And so they can naturally kind of whip up a variety of, of towels made from animals and it takes three seconds and it, well not three seconds, maybe a little longer than that. But it kind of creates one of those thoughtful kind of moments in their hotel that works at their hotel. But if I tried to talk at the, to the Hampton downtown Durham when I stayed last night and said, okay, Hamptonality is, is scripted, it's all about uh, now, all of you have to come up with folded towel animals to go in your guest room. We can probably guess what would happen, right? That would bomb. So it can't be command and control. It's not a one size fits all. Again, it has to go back to leveraging strengths. And, and that's, that's, again, it's, it's, it's the bigger you get within your organizations that you're growing, the more you're gonna have to learn that balance between how much do I control versus how much am I willing to give up and kind of grow organically if I have the right kind of guidepost in place. This is another one of our hotels. Um, she kind of took off thin and careful. This is Diana Bernardo at the Hampton Inn, Ephrata, Pennsylvania. And what she did is kind of a, adopted a mascot of a turtle is the way their hotel was going to display friendly, authentic, caring, and thoughtful because turtles stick their neck out for guests and for each other. So once she knew the guideposts, she developed and the hotel has little stuffed animal turtles that they give to kids and on commercial business accounts, on sales calls, etc. But that's kind of become the way that they make it happen. I couldn't command that to happen. In fact, there are probably some companies who would get scared to say, what, they got some mascot thing going on or whatever that doesn't have anything to do with the brand? No. It's allowing everybody to bring their best self and their strength to work every day to create that culture that feeds into the command and control. So it's not about command and control. It's about giving it up. And this is one I really love to bunking, and it's culture won't translate. I spend a whole bunch of time on airplanes. Um, and, uh, you know, if we paint with a broad brush, there's a lot of perceptions that, oh, okay, something works in the U.S. and it doesn't work outside of the country, or even within our own country. This is something that'll work in the South, because, yeah, it's Southern, and say howdy and be sweet and all that, but that'll never work on the West Coast because it's insincere, blah, 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 blah. The, I, I, there may be a little bit of truth in that. But I think if you really focus on the basics, that doesn't, that's, that's not the case. It can, it can break free. Um, one of the first hotels that we opened outside of the US seven or eight years ago was in Berlin, Germany. And so 